the Distinguished Seminar Series today. The Distinguished Seminar Series features presentations by outstanding thinkers and scientists sponsored by the Allen Institute for Brain Science. Distinguished speakers are selected based on their impact for interdisciplinary research and the neuroscience community. Today, we're delighted to host Anatole Kreitzer, a senior investigator at the Gladstone Institute of Neurological Disease and a professor of physiology and neurology at the University of California, San Francisco. Anatole is a leader in connecting cell types and cell signaling to circuit and behavioral function in the basal ganglia. He did his graduate work with Wade Regeer at Harvard Medical School, where he was the first to show cannabinoid-mediated suppression at excitatory synapses. In his postdoc with Rob Malenka at Stanford, he pioneered the use of transgenic mice to demonstrate physiological differences between medium spiny neurons in the direct and indirect pathways of the basal ganglia. And he connected those differences to the pathology and treatment of Parkinson's disease. In his own lab, he's a leader in integrating optogenetics, physiology, and imaging to connect to cellular physiology to behavior and disease, most famously using optogenetics to directly test the classical model of the basal ganglia that serves as the foundation for our understanding of many movement disorders, including Parkinson's and Huntington's disease. He's been recognized by a number of prestigious awards, including the Scholar Awards from the Pew and McKnight Foundations and the prestigious Society for Neuroscience Young Investigator Award. Anatole is also, as I can personally attest, an exceptionally supportive, thoughtful, and insightful mentor who's placed many of his trainees at leading positions in academia, medicine, and industry. In his more recent work, he's been steadily transitioning from a cell biologist to a systems physiologist, and I imagine that the exciting work we'll hear about today will include some of the latest steps in that transformation. Anatole will present Mapping the Functional Connectivity of Motor Thalamus. Thank you, Anatole. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Uh, it's great to be here, by here being in my office, I guess. Uh, it's great to see lots of familiar names on the participant list, so uh, thanks for showing up. Uh, so today I'm actually going to talk about completely unpublished work and kind of a new direction for the lab, although obviously kind of related to our general interest in basal ganglia. So for years we kind of focused on basal ganglia circuitry uh, in the striatum and kind of the roles of direct and indirect pathway neurons, as Scott mentioned, as well as the, the role of intraneurons. More recently, we've become interested in understanding the output of the basal ganglia, first in the brainstem uh, to, for example, the mesenspheric locomotor region, uh, regions that are you know, controlling basic kind of evolutionarily conserved motor functions. But we're also interested kind of more recently in this classical model output to, to the thalamus and really kind of understanding, you know, what does the basal ganglia do in thalamus? It provides inhibitory inputs, so not your typical kind of driver-like inputs. Uh, and really how does um, the thalamocortical motor circuitry interact with these basal ganglia inputs? And, so today we're just kind of starting to get a handle on this. It's kind of a, it's a really new uh, research direction in the lab. And I want to immediately kind of call out uh, the, the very talented postdoc who's working on this, uh, Tony Lian. He, he was in Massimo's lab for his PhD, where he, Massimo Scanziani's lab, where he studied, you know, visual thalamus and cortex interactions. Uh, he came to my lab a few years ago to kind of think about how motor thalamus and thalamocortical interactions might be working. And he's really spearheaded uh, this work. And so I wanna really just give a, a shout out to him to begin with. Um, so the outline today, uh, I will give you this kind of broad overview of motor thalamus. Uh, and then I'll talk about kind of three uh, broad areas that we've been working in. Again, this is all unpublished and somewhat preliminary, uh, although, you know, this represents a few a year's worth of work. Um, the first thing I'll mention is this functional mapping of basal ganglia recipient thalamus. So motor thalamus receives inputs, and I'm, I'll talk about this in a moment, from more than just basal ganglia, but we are particularly interested in these basal ganglia recipient neurons. Um, we've recorded from these neurons, identified them in vivo and awake behaving head fixed mice uh, that are running on a treadmill and using this, Tony was able to identify something pretty interesting, which is that they are actually exquisitely tuned um, to the stride of the animal. And, uh, and Tony has also used focal cortical silencing to really map um, 
the sources of input from the cortex back into the thalamus and sort of revealing the drivers of basal ganglia uh, thalamus activity. All right, so to begin, uh, just so we're all kind of oriented, I know many people in the audience obviously know the thalamus quite well. Uh, this is just kind of the textbook view of thalamus, and I just wanted to highlight these kind of key kind of classical motor nuclei, so VAVL, uh, and um, really which kind of NVM, which is not shown in that particular schematic. These are kind of the three um, kind of motor nuclei, but in general, there's this idea that thalamic nuclei can be classified in various ways. And I think, and this kind of gets into, you know, work, recent work from the Allen Institute, in fact, um, but this goes back, you know, to, to you know, decades before work from Murray Sherman and others in which, you know, nuclei are distinguished as either core nuclei or matrix nuclei. And there's also this first order, higher order classification, somewhat related, uh, but the idea is that there are kind of these first order or core nuclei, which classically would be an example of the LGN, lateral geniculate nucleus, which receives subcortical sensory driver input, typically excitatory input. Uh, and those uh, project to fairly focally to layer four of cortex, for example, in V1. And that would be kind of a classic first order core nucleus. Um, and then there are uh, these higher order nuclei, also kind of known as matrix nuclei, they share some similarities. Um, I should mention first order, higher order kind of really re refers to where their driver inputs are coming from, whereas core matrix kind of refers to their projection patterns. Um, so these higher order nuclei receive cortical driver inputs largely from layer five and project uh, back into uh, more superficial layers, layer one, although obviously others as well, but kind of, kind of classically into layer one and tend to project a little more broadly. Um, now, as I mentioned, I mean, this is, I wanted to highlight this paper from Alan because obviously uh, this is highly relevant. Uh, and if you kind of look in an unbiased way at just kind of the axonal arborizations, you know, you can map uh, at least, um, you know, in this paper, uh, you were able to map, uh, you know, these into four kind of broad classes. So, you know, again, core nuclei that kind of focally project into layer uh, four and, and, and then these kind of um, matrix nuclei, which were distinguished as, you know, either kind of focal or, you know, multi-aerial and, uh, or kind of in between. And so, uh, that, this classification really at the, at the, at the, at the level of kind of axonal arborization, um, uh, it was done in this very, in the broad way. And I think what's interesting is you can see in, when we think about the, mo the classical motor nuclei, which are, would be VAL in this case, um, those basically look like base matrix-like nuclei, right? Uh, whereas VM is even, it's kind of the more classical multi-aerial kind of matrix nuclei. And again, because it projects, typically VM projects a little more frontally as well as into the sensory motor cortex. Now, um, another recent paper from Adam Hantman, sort of rather than looking at the, the, the cortical projection pattern per se, used kind of looked at transcript transcriptomic profiling of, of, of these cell types and just look for similarities there and use um, kind of this uh, unbiased, you know, clustering algorithm to basically classify uh, nuclear. He identified kind of five patterns. And so accurate dorsal and reunions are kind of their own thing. But in terms of broad categories, uh, they found, you know, that there are this kind of core-like primary nuclei clustered together. There's this kind of matrix or secondary-like cluster and then intralaminar nuclei um, clustered uh, as well separately. And I should mention that the intralaminar was also in the previous slide, right? You could say that the IL um, has a very, you know, distinct pattern of, uh, of uh, projections, largely into striatum, actually. So, um, so I would say in general, um, the transcriptomic profiling kind of identified classes that look pretty similar, but at the level of motor thalamus, there's actually kind of an interesting distinction here, which was that VA and VL actually were kind of split, where VL was classified as a core-like nucleus and VA was in VM were classified as matrix-like nuclei. And I think that's interesting on a number of levels, and I can kind of get into this a little bit. Um, so what, what um, this paper did nicely actually was uh, use retrobeads from, from motor cortex to label motor thalamus broadly. Here you can see, a v, you can see VA and VL and, uh, and a little bit of VM labeled 
And then at the, in the same experiment, they were able to label uh, inputs either from cerebellum, so DCN, deep cerebellum nuclei, or from uh, the basal ganglia, SNR, right, substantia nigra reticulata. So these are these kind of two major inputs to motor thalamus, and those do kind of tend to segregate into VAVL with this kind of area in between where you see a lot of, um, you know, overlap and innervation. So what's interesting about that to me, of course, is that, you know, DCN inputs are glutamatergic, sort of more like those classical driver-like inputs that you might expect from a core nucleus, whereas uh, VA and VM are receiving basal ganglia inputs largely, and those are GABAergic inputs. Uh, and there's been a little bit of a controversy, actually, as to whether those are driver whether they can drive via rebound excitation kind of, you know, um, activity there, or whether they're actually modulator, uh, whether basal ganglia is la largely a modulator input, which I think is probably the case, just based on what I've seen. Uh, and that the cortex, layer five cortical inputs are largely the driver. And, not in, 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 and I'll actually touch on that today in the talk. So it does look like, you know, you could potentially split VA and VM, yes, basal ganglia recipient thalamus, off from VL, which is kind of classical cerebellar recipient thalamus. Uh, but anyway, that, that, that region is what I'll kind of generally refer to uh, uh, motor thalamus, as motor thalamus. So kind of coming back to axonal projection patterns, um, this is one of the earlier kind of single axon tracing studies that was, was done. Um, it's this paper from 2009, Kromoto et al., where they showed, um, they kind of looked at neurons in what they call the inhibitory zone, IZ, which refers to the basal ganglia re recipient zone, right, getting inhibitory inputs from, from uh, GPI and SNR, um, or the EZ, which they call the excitatory zone, which is the cerebellar recipient zone. And what they found is sort of consistent uh, with this idea of kind of very different axonal production patterns from these two regions, maybe corresponding to kind of core matrix-like nuclei, these inhibitory zone neurons not only made collaterals in the striatum, but they also sent projections typically of a broader region, so from M2 all the way back to S1, uh, and typically uh, were most dense in, in layer one. And they kind of summarized it in this, in this particular um, panel where they kind of highlight the difference between the IZ, EZ, or, or I should say, you know, basal ganglia recipient, cerebellar recipient. And again, they kind of have this more, um, this, this split between innervating kind of larger regions of layer one, so kind of multi aerial uh, you know, matrix-like projections in the Allen Institute terminology versus these kind of more focal and deeper uh, projections associated with, with the cerebellar recipient. All right, so this is kind of just going through some of the basic anatomy. Um, at a broader scale, there have been, and this is going back to, you know, the 80s now, early 80s, there's this kind of classic paper from Malin DeLong, Peter Strick, uh, this Alexander DeLong Strick paper, where they showed that, proposed the existence of these parallel segregated loops uh, from cortex through basal ganglia and thalamus and back to cortex. And, you know, using these kind of old school rabies tracing um, kind of showed that there are uh, these sub, sub loops within the basal ganglia, right, that, you know, um, different parts of the cortex, so kind of more kind of classical motor cortices are projecting into the putamen or, the, you know, the dorsal lateral striatum, and these project, you know, through lateral parts of, of basal ganglia nuclei to, v, to kind of lateral parts of, of VAVL, um, whereas there are these more kind of associative and kind of eye movement associated areas that project into more uh, kind of more VA. Uh, and then there are kind of these, these limbic circuits, which are more kind of ventral striatum related, and these project, um, you know, through VM and MD largely, right? So there, there's this idea that, the, that there are these kind of many different subcircuits that kind of involve different parts of the basal ganglia. And even at the level of kind of at the more synaptic level, and this kind of highlights this paper from Gordon Shepard, uh, where they show this kind of pretty interesting finding if they um, looked at neurons in VM, and these are neurons that you know, project frontally, and in this case, they're looking at ALM, this, this, this licking-related region that you know, Carl Savota's lab has studied extensively. Um, what they find is that you know, VM neurons project into ALM, uh, you know, largely to layer one, but also in deeper layers. And that these ALM neurons, in turn, project back to VM, but target neurons that 
reciprocally connect back into ALM, and they tend to avoid VM neurons that project into M1, really kind of indicating that there are the, even within particular uh, region like VM to ALM, there are these kind of really sub kind of circuits that are highly specific in order to kind of forming potentially substrates for kind of reverberant activity. And this kind of gets into kind of more functional ideas of, you know, what is the thalamus actually doing? And uh, Mike Colossa published this, this, this review recently in which he kind of talked about the classical model of, you know, kind of first order, higher order nuclei in which, you know, this classic relay for the first order and the higher order are sort of largely, you know, subserving cortical, cortical, you know, connectivity. Um, but what Mike is kind of making the point in this review is that, in fact, you have these reciprocal circuits that are kind of maintaining particular cortical states, and that could be important for representations, for short-term memory, uh, but also it could be really important for cortical cortical connectivity as well, and, you know, um, establishing particular states in the cortex that are important for, um, for various features of movement. In fact, you know, in this more recent paper from Adam Hammond's group where they were using optogenetics to, um, you know, to stimulate reticularis neurons and very transiently suppress thalamus, they were able to show that motor thalamus is really critical, um, not only for, for movement planning uh, and initiation, but, but really for the maintenance of, of, a, of, a, of a movement. So if they, if they suppressed in the middle of a, of, a, of a reach, they could actually disrupt that reach. So implying that, you know, it's not merely for kind of setting up initial conditions. And then of course, this other kind of paper now from, from Carl Svoboda's lab, I think many of you are probably familiar with this work in which they, uh, you know, record in ALM, again, this frontal cortical region associated with licking, uh, but then they can suppress in VM and thalamus, motor thalamus, and that can actually disrupt this reverberant activity between the two uh, regions, and in addition, disrupt uh, this preparatory uh, movement kind of related activity that then disrupts subsequent choice in this, this delayed match to sample task. So, um, it does seem that you know motor thalamus can play various roles in sort of call it kind of classic short-term memory type um, kind of maintenance of activity as well as you know establishing and maintaining you know cortical dynamics, which the, the Sauerbrot paper I think showed very nicely. But you know, with all this information that we have, you know, which I would say is kind of deep anatomical and now transcriptomic information about you know the locations of cells, their projection patterns. Uh, even their kind of cellular electrophysiology and some connectivity. Uh, we know all this and we also kind of know now kind of in vivo what, you know, the firing properties of these cells can look like, you know, from in vivo recordings and also now some of the kind of functional implications of activating or suppressing those neurons. But there's still quite a knowledge gap, which is that, you know, due to technical limitations, it's really been difficult to combine these things together, right? In other words, it's been difficult to understand how these anatomically defined cell types, for example, basal ganglia recipient neurons versus cerebellar recipient neurons actually map onto function. And that's kind of the, the goal of Tony's project is really to kind of um, try to bridge this gap. And to do this, he's really gonna take advantage of some pretty sophisticated methodologies uh, to, to be able to record um, and identify you know, various aspects of, of um, both inputs and outputs of these, of these uh, thalamic neurons. So, so how does, so to, to begin with really Tony's goal was to understand, um, you know, can we record from basal ganglia recipient units in VAVL? So to do this, we're gonna use optogenetics and he actually, you know, so we use, we kind of settled upon using um, indirect pathway stimulation in the striatum as a very reliable and robust way of identifying these units in thalamus. So to do this, we use A2A Cre animals. We're going to inject uh, the Cre-dependent channel rhodopsin into dorsal lateral striatum and implant a fiber there. And then we're, uh, you know, mouse is going to be head fixed. And what Tony is going to do is in, implant, you know, really acutely drive in high density recording probes into VAVL. And you know, we can reconstruct their location using DII, for example. And then he can stimulate while recording from lots of units. And um, what he sees is that, you know, there are these certain units like the one on the right, which are very robustly and very reliably suppressed by indirect pathway stimulation. So these are the ones that we're calling basal ganglia recipient neurons. Um, 
And what he noticed, and that's this is kind of on the left, I've just drawn you drawn kind of roughly where this these probes are, are coming in. Uh, so that he's kind of hitting a little bit of kind of right into this region where uh, kind of more dorsally you're getting innervation from both, or maybe initially just cerebellum, and then there's maybe this zone of kind of both you know, cerebellar recipient and basal ganglia recipient, um, and then kind of more ventrally, it's kind of more classically in the VA or even VM in some cases where it's almost all basal ganglia recipient units. And that kind of, you know, when you, when you kind of sort all the units by, by their location, by their depth, uh, that's kind of precisely what he sees. Um, so in this particular example of just a single recording, you can see that more dorsally, you know, units are not suppressed much by IMSN or indirect pathway neuron stimulation. As you go more ventrally, you see pretty robust uh, suppression. And there's this nice zone there, right, you know, kind of on the, on the bottom part that, that is um, you know, strongly suppressed. So that's just kind of a single example. And, um, and that really now gives us the ability, in, you know, in these awake behaving animals, to identify those basal ganglia recipient neurons. But Tony really wasn't content to stop there. He also wanted to understand, you know, where these basal ganglia recipient neurons were projecting the cortex. So, so to do this, um, he actually decided to take advantage of uh, these red shifted opsins, uh, another uh, uh, crimson. And so he's going to use A2A CRE and inject the stride in with, with a uh, Dio crimson, cre dependent crimson implanted fiber there. And then he's going to put CAMK2 channel rhodopsin into ventral thalamus. Uh, that's going to label up those cells and their axons projecting into cortex. Uh, and again, uh, uh, what he wants to do is kind of understand where uh, the cells are projecting, right? You can get this, this detailed, you know, this information anatomically, obviously in tissue, but you want to understand in, in this awake baby animal. So then he's going to he built a galvo system to, to actually stimulate, you know, transcranially with a thin, cleared skull, you know, all these different sites um, in, in the cortex. And then he's going to use antidromic stimulation uh, to identify, you know, regions basically where, the, where those axons can be stimulated. And so this just shows an example in which he's kind of done two things at the same time. He's identified you know, the unit is basal ganglia recipient by stimulating IMSNs with crimson. And then at the same time, he's generated this, this map of um, this cortical map showing that this particular neuron actually projects both to more kind of more anteriorly as well as more posteriorly. And, you know, using kind of classical kind of old school methodology really confirmed that this, this antidromic stimulation was valid. So just kind of for any trainees in the audience or those who are not hardcore electrophysiologists, I kind of just walk through this methodology. It's, it's old school, but it's pretty cool, kind of as applied in this way. So again, uh, high density recordings in motor thalamus. Uh, so lots of units there, um, single units identified. And then stimulating these small parts of uh, a cortical surface. And um, what you can do then is in some cells, you can elicit um, these antidermic spikes, which, you know, the key is uh, that these should be very, um, you know, very, very low jitter, right? If these are kind of classic antidermic spikes, they should all kind of come in. The, the, the conduction delay is going to be identical from trial to trial. And so, um, and indeed, what he sees is this very kind of sub millisecond jitter, right? All the spikes come in about seven and a half milliseconds right after he turns on the, the light. Um, and most of that delay, by the way, is not conduction delay. It's just, you know, the, um, probably the delay to actually trigger a spike optically. Uh, but, but also notice that there were, you know, three trials here in which a spike was spontaneously occurred in the cell body. Um, and in those, in those cases, it allows you to look at this, this kind of, whether there's a collision between spikes. And, and, and actually, um, the idea is if you have this antidromic spike and a kind of orthodromic spike at the same time, they're going to collide and ablate each other. They, and, and what you're then going to see is, is um, no antidromic spike is going to occur in the cell body. And that's precisely what he sees. So really kind of, kind of using old school hardcore electrophysiology to kind of confirm that, you know, he's able to do this antidromic mapping, right? Submillisecond jitter and, and this collision. Um, so what... So he obviously can do this across large numbers of cells, right, in, in each animal. So this is, this is pretty cool. Um, and this just shows here now some, some aggregated data of kind of 
you know, where, again, where do you see uh, basal ganglia um, recipient neurons located? And here, um, depth zero is going to be kind of uh, used as the beginning of that basal ganglia recipient zone. So essentially, all the kind of recordings are going to be aligned on that dorsal ventral axis to this beginning of the, of the zone, which is going to be depth of zero, just so you're kind of oriented. And so that data is shown on the left, right? Here's like all the units these were recorded from. Quite a lot of units, as you, you know, not surprisingly, you know, it's again those kind of ventral um, neurons uh, in VA and VM that are largely suppressed by MSN stem. If you look now at the axonal projection area, you see something, you know, um, kind of consistent with I think this kind of multi aerial versus focal matrix like projection, right? You see that. You know, more dorsally, there, where you're not getting basal ganglia recipient, maybe this kind of more classical, um, like VL, cerebellar recipient region, uh, you see that those axonal projection areas are a little bit more focal, whereas the, um, the area, um, the, the basal ganglia recipient neurons are actually projecting over a much larger area as kind of assayed by the number of antidromic spots that actually elicit um, a spike. So this is pretty cool because it kind of, you know, this is kind of a way to in, to map in, in an awake behaving animal in real time, right? Like, you know, A, are the neurons basal ganglia recipient or not? And B, kind of where are they projecting? And so um, one other kind of, you know, aspect of this is kind of related to these, these, these parallel circuits. Um, what, what Tony found actually is if you, you know, he, he's inserting a two shank probe. Uh, and so there's a medial and a lateral shank. And the more medial shank, of course, is going to be more in the kind of this VAVM, and the more lateral shank is going to actually be more in this VA, kind of lateral VA and VL, right? And interestingly, if you just kind of sort units by what shank they're recorded on, you actually see that the medial shank, again, kind of more classical kind of basal ganglia recipient, and of course, you know, more VM, I think, was classified in the Allen paper as, you know, being kind of this um, <clears throat> focal matrix you see this projection almost, you know, largely anteriorly, right, to kind of M2. Um, as you go to the lateral shank, you see, the, you see this opposite pattern where you see projections almost largely into M1, S1. Um, so that is kind of the, the pattern that you might, you might actually predict. Um, all right, so there's a question, uh, which is, is it surprising that the basal ganglia stimulation doesn't seem to have striking multisynaptic effects on spiking patterns? Uh, maybe. Um, we, so, you know, the idea there would be, you know, you're stimulating these units and then there's these reverberant, you know, art, you know, reticularis circuits, that's rever reverberant, you know, downward cortical circuitry. So maybe you're going to get all kinds of um, activity. You know, with the D1, so the direct pathway stimulation actually does cause a much more kind of a larger variety of responses. It's one of the reasons we don't use D1 stim. We use indirect pathway stim. Indirect pathway stim just suppresses activity and the suppression appears to be strong enough that it overrides any potential multisynaptic activity. So again, I think that's one of the reasons that IMSN stim just gives us that more robust readout, um, while at the same time really kind of it doesn't really reveal any of that multisynaptic activity. It's just kind of overriding all that stuff. Um, but I do think there are interesting dynamics. And that maybe later on, you know, there'll be an example of a recording where you will see some kind of interesting multi-synaptic effects. We can chat about it if you want. Okay, so that's sort of um, the end of part one. And I'll kind of pause there and kind of encourage any other questions you have about this functional mapping and, you know, how, <clears throat> you know, how we can, you know, basically an awake behaving animal, um, kind of take a lot of what's been, you know, discovered anatomically and actually kind of map that on to single units in, in an in vivo recording, you know, in a behaving animal. Um, maybe nothing super uh, controversial either in there. So, you know, uh, if there's no questions, I'm happy to move on. Um, I will uh, turn now to what I think is kind of the most interesting aspect of this, which is you know, how does activity in these populations actually relate to the behavior of the animal? And, uh, and I, I, I want to preface this by saying, you know, locomotion is kind of, 
It's an interesting behavior because it's not, I would say, a behavior that I would classically associate with, um, you know, cortical activity, right? I mean, we know that clearly cortical activity is related to locomotion, and you can certainly, you know, put channel adoption in M1 and stimulate, and you can drive locomotion. And I think that was Carl Dyserov's, you know, first paper in 2007 where they you know, stuck a, stuck a fiber in a rat was basically that experiment, right? Stimulate M1 and, yeah, and the mice kind of, and, and the rats in that case would run around, right? But it's, it's clear that you actually don't, you don't even need cortex to drive locomotion, right? And we've, of all groups, we've looked at this in exquisite detail. Um, you can just stimulate a single population of neurons in the brain stem of, you know, kind of in the area of the peduncular pontine nucleus, the mesenthalic locomotor region. And those neurons project into spinal cord and drive, you know, coordinated normal locomotion, right? In a very nice graded way, right? The faster you stimulate, the faster they run. Um, so we don't have any illusions that locomotion is this kind of cortically driven phenomenon, although clearly I think there's this relationship. But um, I, we do think that the cortex actually cares about activity related to locomotion. In that sense, it's critical that the cortex knows, you know, what um, what the animal's doing at any given time, and in particular, you know, where its limbs are in this locomotor cycle, because it may need to, at any point, you know, adjust its course, step over an obstacle, etc. So I think, you know, a lot of this locomotor activity that we're going to be um, be talking about in the thalamus, and you know, Tony's recorded in cortex, we've recorded in you know GPI, is all kind of related to this, you know, likely efferent type copy. Um, of this, this locomotor um, signaling. Okay, there's another question, um, which is that, you know, I might be getting the types mixed up, but could an explanation for observing fewer spots and antidromic stimulation be because the axons are deeper? Yeah, okay. Good question. We've thought about this. It's absolutely the case that the, you know, as I described, right, the cerebellar recipient neurons being more core-like or not projecting into layer one as strongly, and therefore might be harder to stimulate because of their depth. We don't think that that's what's happening here. We've actually, you know, Tony was pretty careful on this. You know, with he, when he stimulates to get elicit antidromic spikes, um, he uses a whole range of intensities uh, from about, you know, 0.5 milliwatts up to five milliwatts. So a whole order of magnitude of intensities. And he can reliably elicit antidromic spikes at pretty low laser powers. Um, but he does go all the way up to the highest laser powers, up to, you know, five milliwatts, and we see the same pattern. So we don't think it's, you know, merely that, you know, we're just not penetrating cortex. Um, we, we, we do think that this is a, represents a real difference in projection pattern, and I think the reason we're also a little bit more confident in this is precisely because of the uh, anatomy that's been done on this, right, which is kind of matches very nicely with this, which is that, you know, the VL projections are just a little bit more focal, uh, whereas the VAVM projections are a little bit more uh, multi-aerial, right? Um, another question, could you briefly clarify again which regions in basal ganglia uh, project the motor thalamus? Uh, so the classic projections of motor thalamus are from GPI and SNR. So these are kind of the two classic basal ganglia output nuclei. Um, in the GPI in rodents, of course, is known as the EP or the antipeduncular nucleus. And so those are kind of the two outputs, primary outputs to motor thalamus. Um, there are other outputs to thalamus. Um, uh, and there, so for example, GPE has a pretty strong projection in the parafascicular, you know, intralaminar thalamus. So there are some kind of interesting, like kind of non, I'd say non-classical projections. But into motor thalamus proper, the, really the vast majority of those inputs are coming from, from GPI and SNR. Okay. Um, if there are no more questions, I will um, turn now to behavior. And as I mentioned, I think, you know, Tony actually spent the first two years of this project training mice to pull a lever. And not just pull lever, you train them to pull lever, or to push a lever, or, you know, we were thinking about left and right, you know, like a little like wheel, lots of different things we were trying to do to kind of, oh, to, to drive these kind of uh, 
M1 cortical dynamics that might be, you know, modulated by thalamus. But in the end, you know, locomotion turned out to have the most robust kind of activity relationships and you don't have to train the mice to run and they can run like tens of thousands of steps in a recording session, right? So you get this really, um, you know, large numbers of trials that give you this, this ability to kind of, um, you know, cut through lots of signals and noise, right? So this is, um, this has been the strategy that we've been taking. Uh, the mice are on a circular transparent treadmill with a high-speed camera underneath. And then we're using deep lab cut to track the positions of the fore and hind limbs uh, during, during locomotion. So this is pretty much what it looks like. And, you know, the way Tony has this set up is, you know, the mice basically have to do five complete rotations of the wheel and they get like a drop of um, sucrose. And so that's sort of uh, essentially how it works. And um, he's focused largely on the contralateral forelimb, forepaw, uh, to the recording site. <clears throat> and so if you're looking at the forepaw uh, during locomotion, it can be split into this you know, swing stays and a stance phase. And, uh, and the, the swing and stance phase together constitute one stride cycle. And then, of course, the animals are, you know, over a recording session or, like I said, tens of thousands of stride cycles. The beauty of these, of course, is that they're very stereotyped and you see very little variance. And so we can look at this now. Um, we, can, we can align this kind of stride cycle, uh, you know, across all these you know, various strides and then look at the activity of neurons. <coughs> and so here's an example of, of two units recorded in motor thalamus in which you see one of them is, appears to show some preference for a particular uh, phase in, um, in, the, in, the, in the stride. Uh, and the other unit, unit two, really shows very little kind of stride tuning, right? It, it, it seems to be uh, not very sensitive uh, to locomotor stride. So these are kind of two examples, and one of a, of a fairly, you know, strongly tuned um, unit and one that's not strongly tuned. And of course, the, the interesting thing, thing here is that what Tony can do is, you know, identify whether these units are basically getting the recipient or not, and look at their cortical projection map, right? And so what do you see? Is it, pretty interesting. And I think this is, this particular examples were chosen because I think they're largely emblematic of kind of highlight kind of some of the key differences here. But um, typically these strongly stride to neurons are also preferentially projecting into M1, S1, whereas the non-stride tuned units are actually um, preferentially projecting um, more uh, front, more anteriorly. So I think this is pretty interesting uh, and potentially consistent with this idea of various subloops through the basal ganglia thalamic cortical system, you know, some of which care about motor activity and some of which may not care about motor activity. Uh, and so I think that's very clear here in this, in this particular um, example. But, you know, it's worth noting, of course, that, that stride modulation itself actually occurs throughout motor thalamus. And so in this particular example, um, again, kind of showing on the left the um, you know, modulation index by indirect pathway stem. In other words, the basal ganglia recipient units, which are lined up kind of on the more ventral side, uh, more dorsally, you don't see that kind of modulation. So these are the putative cerebellar recipient units. If you look at the stride modulation index across all of these neurons, you actually don't see a big difference between, you know, the you know, putative VAVL neurons, right? They, they, many of them are stride modulated, certainly not all of them, um, but many of them are stride modulated really throughout the whole dorsoventral axis here. Uh, but in general, if you sort neurons by, you know, how stride tuned they are, you see some interesting differences in projection. So this, this is kind of a, a summary of, of the recordings that Tony has done. And frankly, it's, pretty impressive. Uh, so across 11 mice in 34 sessions, 
we got about 1,300 units, 700 of which were suppressed by indirect pathway. So 700 basal ganglion recipient units. Of those, about 420, uh, he was able to get cortical projection maps from. And of those, he was able to get about 230 stride modulated units. Um, so, you know, this really provides, you know, an immense amount of work and an immense amount of data, but also now kind of allows us to look at, you know, some of these properties on a larger scale. Uh, so let's see, there was a question which was, did you look for units that were tuned for stride deviations from the mean stride? Um, so that we have not looked at specifically, I would say deviations are intriguing, right? So I think I've been kind of encouraging Tony to put an obstacle on that ball so that, you know, every like, you know, every time it goes around, it's got to step over something and we could kind of potentially, you know, look at those deviated strides because I know I have some predictions about, you know, what that might look like. And um, we have not done that yet, but I think it's a great question. It's something we want to, we want to follow up on because it kind of gets at what, why is cortex and why are these thalamocortical cortical circuits, you know, forming these and, pretty detailed representations of, you know, where these limbs are, right? Um, so great question. Um, we want to, we want to look at it. Um, so anyway, this is kind of a summary of the units. And on the left, you can just see units are sort of tuned by how, 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 uh, by, uh, sorted by how stride tuned they are. And then um, on the right, you can see all the projection maps. And if you just look at this whole population, you know, across all the cells from, from strongly stride tuned to weakly stride tuned, what you see is that, you know, there's no bimodal distribution per se, um, either with regard to stride modulation itself. It's not like there's like, you know, some strongly stride modulated and some not. I mean, it does appear to be kind of a broad distribution across the population, uh, perhaps representing some distribution of synaptic inputs that are coding stride. And we have some ideas about where those are coming from. And, I'm guessing it's cerebellum. We're guessing it's cerebellum, but we don't know, but we think that. We have some evidence for that. Um, and we also don't see any kind of, you know, bimodal distribution in terms of, you know, preference for various phases of stride. So it seems like, you know, um, neurons are tuned to both swing and stance. And again, we don't know what that really means, right? I mean, these are, we, we, we've aligned these to the contralateral four paw, but we can't say with any certainty that, you know, there aren't units also responding to the ipsilateral forepaw or frankly to the contralateral hindpaw, right? I think mean, these are all possibilities, but we have to align to something and we're aligning to the contralateral forepaw and this is, and we're seeing this kind of broad range of tuning. And I think that could mean a variety of things. Um, and it's just a little bit, of, it's impossible to, to, to more specifically interpret the data right now. Um, if you look at the projection maps for all these units, you do see that there is a bimodal distribution, however, into where these areas are projecting in the cortex. So you see this kind of, this focal <clears throat> region, which likely corresponds to M2 more anteriorly. And then you see this, this gap, and then you see this kind of region more um, posteriorly corresponding to this kind of M1, S1 region. Uh, however, if you now, sort units as either weakly, medium, or strongly stride modulated, and then look at their projection center of mass, you do kind of reveal something pretty interesting, uh, which is what I alluded to in that first data slide, which is that weakly stride projecting neurons on average are projecting more frontally, and strongly stride modulated units on average are projecting uh, more caudally, right? More, more into that S1, M1 region. And so this may represent, you know, something a more broad, I think it's a really kind of representing a broad principle about, you know, you know, what these neurons are really, you know, encoding and again, what information they're sending to cortex. And um, it's, we obviously, I like to identify other features of the behavior that those medially projecting neurons are responding to. But now at least we have a good handle that, you know, the, the, this locomotion represents this kind of robust encoding, at least for these, these more caudally or M1, S1 projecting neurons. Um, there's also some interesting kind of subtleties when it comes to um, the stride phase preference. 
uh, and these are relatively subtle effects, but you know, if you look at the kind of whether the neurons are tuned to either the swing or the stance phase, you actually see some, some subtle differences. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll sort of, this is just kind of shows you, you know, sorting units by where they're tuned to and then looking at their projection patterns, you can see, you know, some, some subtle differences uh, with regard to where they're projecting. And that's kind of quantified here. In other words, units that are kind of more tuned to the swing phase of the contralateral forepaw. And again, I don't pretend to think that this is really, you know, these units might all be, there's a different ways to interpret this data. It could be, you know, the swing of the contralateral forepaw. It could be the stance of the, it could be the, you know, stance of the contralateral hindpaw, right? Or, you know, the stance of the ipsilateral forepaw. That being said, there is, you know, when aligned to that contralateral forepaw, we see these interesting differences, the swing, neurons are just shifted a little bit more, you know, anteriorly, the stance are a little bit more posteriorly, you know, might this correspond to an S1, M1 projection? Maybe. I mean, it's tempting to think that the swing units are projecting to M1 and stance units are projecting to S1, um, given that they're slightly offset, uh, you know, anterior, posteriorly. So that's, I think, kind of a cool idea. And, you know, with the stance units, we might have some predictions that we could, like, you know, poke the paw and they might respond, whereas, you know, the swing units may not. I mean, these are all things that we're kind of interested in testing. Um, it's, not, it's not super easy to do that, but, you know, these are just some of the ideas we have. Nevertheless, at this point, we can just show you the data that we have, which I think are pretty interesting. Um, okay, so... Um, the last part of this talk, and I'll just kind of uh, have like what, a couple minutes left, is kind of looking at the drivers of basal ganglia activity. And so to do this, Tony's going to take advantage of a technique that you know he was one of the first people to use, um, you know, kind of all, as was Carl Svoboda's group, and that is um, to use a channel rhodopsin mouse to stimulate um, to stimulate. Uh, interneurons and cortex in focally silence um, a particular region. Now this focal silencing isn't, you know, as spatially precise um, as some of the other techniques like the antidermic stem, but nevertheless, we can build up some maps. So in this case, we're going to cross HOA create a VGAT channel adoption. You know, again, put crimson into striatum and then use a galvo to, you know, um, focally silence different parts of cortex. And in this way, what Tony is able to do is, again, identify basal ganglia recipient neurons, but then look at where, um, which parts of cortex um, suppression leads to, you know, silencing of those thalamic units, right? And again, the idea being, if these units are being driven by cortex, they should be silenced. If they're not being driven by cortex, or they're being driven by other parts of cortex, they won't be silenced. Um, and what Tony sees, of course, is that they're actually interesting differences. So for example, for this unit one and unit two, you can see that, you know, uh, there are locations more caudally that suppress unit one, whereas the unit two is suppressed by cortical locations more anteriorly. Um, and so the methodology, I'll just kind of skip through, it's pretty, pretty simple, but it's just the idea is you stimulate um, interneurons and cortex that then suppresses uh, pyramidal cells. And so, you know, to do this, Tony's stimulating kind of four, um, four points at a time at these different regions. So in this case, kind of anterior to posterior. And, and then here's an example of one of these uh, units that are IMSN suppressed. And what you can see is that cortical silencing has, you know, different effects at different regions. But the, you can quantify the, mac, the site of maximum suppression here, which is, a, you know, plus 1.5 um, AP. So what's the takeaway? Um, well, one of the takeaways that's kind of interesting is that cortical silencing actually is more robust in the basal ganglia recipient zone of thalamus. So it turns out that those cere in the putative cerebellar recipient zone, cortical silencing does not, even at the site of maximum suppression, doesn't really cause much change in activity. We hypothesize that's because those neurons are also receiving driver input from cerebellum. So they're not purely reliant on this excitatory input from cortex for their activity. In contrast, in the basal ganglia recipient zone, the driver inputs are largely coming from layer 5 cortex and not 
from the basal ganglia because those are GABAergic inputs. And again, I think this provides some additional evidence that you know rebound excitation is not a primary you know driver of activity uh, in these basal ganglia recipient thalamic neurons. Here's an example. Uh, I think it kind of gets at maybe some of those dynamics that was referred to in an earlier question. You kind of see here um, some uh, kind of interesting effects, which may you know probably be maybe due to some changes in reticularis or engagement of NRT here. But you know, dynamics aside, what's clear is that cortical silencing has a stronger stronger effect on the basal on the basal ganglia recipient thalamic neurons. Now, interestingly. Um, cortical silencing does not, at least at these specific locations, individually does not seem to impact um, the uh, stride itself. So if you just look at the stride, it looks pretty normal. Um, it, of course, if you were stimulating the entire cortex, you could disrupt locomotion per se, but, um, but in these individual locations, they still run and they still run pretty normally. Um, and it doesn't, the most interesting thing here is if you, if you um, look at the strong and weakly stride neurons, they're both suppressed by cortical silencing. So it's not as if one or the other are, are, are strictly, um, if there's a big difference between cortical silencing and the kind of weakly and strongly stride to neurons. I think the last thing I want to point out is that, again, there's kind of some evidence for reciprocal connections here. So the weakly stride modulated neurons are the ones that project more anteriorly. And not surprisingly, those are also, um, the site of maximal suppression also occurs more anteriorly in those neurons. Now remember the strongly stride modulated neurons are the ones that project more posteriorly. And interestingly in those neurons, the site of, there's the kind of site of strongest suppression is more posterior. So it, it sort of indicates that there are, um, again, evidence for these reciprocal loops where the, you know, neuron, you know, these basal ganglia recipient thalamic neurons that project to the, you know, more, more frontally are not encoding stride and they're also getting inputs from cortical regions more frontally that are also, li also likely not encoding stride. And we've, we've confirmed that with neural pixel recordings across the cortical, um, across the, the AP axis. Uh, whereas these strongly stride modulated neurons do seem to be reciprocally connected more posteriorly with M1S1. Um, so with that, you know, we don't have much time here. I'll just kind of wrap up. Um, so to summarize, Showing you that awake head fixed multi site recordings uh, from motor thalamus combined with optogenetics uh, enables functional mapping of basal ganglia thalamic neurons. Um, stridal indirect pathway activation silences its ventral portion of motor thalamus, which we define as BG thalamus, which also corresponds roughly to this you know, VMVA portion. Um, basal ganglia thalamus units projecting. Posteriorly, the sensory motor cortex are preferentially modulated by stride. Um, basal ganglia thalamus neurons are actually preferentially also driven by cortical input. And if you silence cortex, you actually see uh, a much stronger suppression. And the strength of stride modulation is related to anterior versus posterior origin of cortical innervation, kind of in indicating that um, you know, there are these reciprocal parallel circuits that are set up in which you have kind of um, you know, neurons more medially in thalamus that are projecting frontally and are not stride tuned and also getting inputs from frontal cortex. And you have neurons more laterally in, 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 in motor thalamus, which are strongly stride tuned, which are projecting more caudally into M1S1 and also receiving inputs from M1S1. So that's kind of the, um, so the, the big picture summary. And again, I want to kind of highlight the work of of Tony here, and this is a picture that actually Scott's in as well. Um, so Tony really kind of has done the vast majority of the work on this project. Uh, a grad student in the lab, Max, kind of pioneered some of the early uh, recordings uh, in, in stride modulation, uh, more in the basal ganglia. And I uh, just want to acknowledge our, our funding. Um, so yeah, thank you. I'm happy to take any uh, questions. Let's see, there's a question on the board here. Um, do the mice alter their stride before or after receiving reward? Great question. And we've looked at this, of course, because we, you know, the prediction would be that, you know, maybe, um, you know, reward modulation would be something that the basal ganglia would contribute to this. And uh, you might predict that, uh, that those kinds of uh, signals might be transmitted here. And we did not see really anything, um, I mean, they do obviously, you know, 
they, they speed up, you know, when they go through these stride, these cycles of, 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 you know, five revolutions, right, they kind of speed up, they have, they, they maintain maximal velocity, then they slow down, they drink a little bit, and then they repeat that. We kind of looked at this coding at various times within this kind of meta cycle, right, of, you know, acceleration, peak velocity, deceleration, you know, reward delivery. And, you know, one prediction that we we're kind of interested in would be, hey, wouldn't it be cool if, uh, you know, reward, if those neurons are projected more frontally, you know, we're responding to reward delivery or, you know, maybe, you know, parts of the locomotor, um, you know, parts of locomotion that were either immediately preceding reward or immediately after. We didn't see anything like that. So, um, unfortunately, I mean, and, and we've looked at this both in this task, but also in these, in these kind of lever pulling tasks, because we've, you know, obviously my strong interest is, you know, what does the basal ganglia, you know, why is this basal ganglia modulating these thalamal cortical motor circuits, right? And the obvious thing that the basal ganglia cares about are things like vigor and, you know, speed and, you know, reward and motivation. And thus far, we haven't seen any obvious kind of correlates of that in the, you know, in, in, in those kind of basal ganglia recipient neurons. But uh, so that's kind of where we're at with that. Uh, another question, what's the working hypothesis for BG thal cortex versus cerebellum thalamus cortex contribution to locomotion? Great question. So our working hypothesis is that the cerebellum is kind of a major driver of this kind of efferent copy information. We think it's projecting into VL and that those projections are probably, you know, we, I should, there's something I didn't show, which is we've done some recordings where we've recorded, you know, across the kind of VAVL dorsal ventral access and stimulated DCN. And it turns out that we see pretty robust cerebellar um, input across the entire axis, right? So even the basal ganglia recipient neurons appear to be receiving cerebellar inputs, uh, but just not quite as robustly as the more dorsal ones. Um, so some of that, you know, some of the locomotor activity, you know, across the whole axis could be coming directly from cerebellum, but it's also, I think, quite possible that the cerebellar input to thalamus is then going into the cortex and then coming back in the basal ganglia recipient thalamus. And so that would be kind of an interesting, you know, pathway in which you have kind of cerebellum to VL to M1 back to VA and then back to M1. Uh, and again, you know, basal ganglia can sort of um, primarily regulate that latter, you know, M1 to VA back to, you know, M1, like that circuit in particular, right? So that, that's kind of a working hypothesis. Um, but, and, you know, it also kind of, if we silence cortex, we, we do kind of reduce stride tuning a little bit. So, you know, kind of consistent with that. There's some left, which we think is probably related just from the direct cerebellar input. So um, the answer is it's complicated, but that's kind of our idea, I think. And I, you know, in talking to people like you know, Indira Raman and others who kind of study this cerebellar output, that is kind of, you know, consistent, I think, with people's thinking on, on you know, the output of the cerebellum. And certainly if you disrupt cerebellar output, you can disrupt locomotion as well pretty strongly. So uh, it does, uh, that is kind of a, I think, a, a highly relevant um, output. So let's see another question. Do you have a sense of yet of how specific stride tuning you've observed is to locomotion? Yes. Yeah. So. It's a little tricky, right? So, so one idea would be, can we just, you know, look at, we have, we have, like I said, we have data, large data sets from mice, you know, performing these, these four lamp, you know, these uh, reaching tasks, right, lever pulling. And so one idea would be, can, you know, can, we, can we sort of look at, you know, tuning to these lever poles? And, and the answer is it's not quite as, e it's not quite that easy because, you know, the beauty of locomotion is that it's, it's highly, it's, it's not, it, you know, it's, it's, it's very, um, what's the word? It's not very, it's not variable, right? It's just, it's, it's, it's a very stereotype behavior and we can get, you know, again, tens of thousands of cycles. The lever pulling was never as stereotyped. You know, they pull, every time they pull lever, it's like a little bit different. There's all kinds of trajectories. Sometimes they stop halfway, then they pull a little bit more and we can get maybe a couple hundred trials at best, right? So. The answer is we don't know um, because we don't have that same resolution to identify stride tuning with these other kind of, um, you know, motor behaviors as we do with locomotion. So, you know, I think, you know, if we can, if, if there is a behavior that mice perform with their forelimbs, 
that is as stereotyped and repetitive as locomotion, and we're able to look at that kind of maybe tuning in like, you know, across that behavior, that would be fantastic. We don't know what that behavior is. I'm happy to take suggestions. Um, but thus far, we just don't have a behavior that provides that kind of depth of um, <clears throat> grooming is interesting. Um, they don't, <laughs> grooming as you know, I mean, there is this kind of syntactic chain of, you know, um, starting with the nose and working their way to their face and then kind of down, down to the body. But it's, it's also, unfortunately, A, it's not as stereotyped. It, 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 they're all variants of grooming and, um, and they don't do it quite as much as, as, as locomotion. So, um, and being head fixed, I think, tends to disrupt grooming quite a bit. So, yeah, I'm not sure if that's going to cut it, but you know, I, well, I mean, it's something we're keenly interested in, but again, we don't have a clear answer for, unfortunately. Any other questions? All right, well, thanks for coming, everybody. Really appreciate it. Um, looking forward to, you know, the small group meetings later. Um, yeah, thanks, everybody. Thank you for being here today. You can find a recording of this seminar in a few days on the Distinguished Seminar page on our website. We hope we'll see you at future events. Thank you.